And we are live on Facebook. It's my great pleasure to welcome everyone here today to our New Jersey Constitutional Republicans virtual conversation. And I would like to introduce my most distinguished guest today. We've had about 80 different people, but none more distinguished than Dr. Robert George. Doctor, thank you for joining me. It is my pleasure, Mr. Carmen. Thanks for inviting me on. And um, Robert Peter George is an American legal scholar, political philosopher, political public intellectual, serves as the sixth McCormick Professor of Jurisprudence and Director of the James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions at Princeton University. He lectures on constitutional interpretation, civil liberties, philosophy of law and political philosophy. George is considered one of the country's leading conservative intellectuals. In my opinion, he is the number one leading conservative intellectual. <laughs> now, in addition to his uh, profession, prof, 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 professorship rather at Princeton, he is also the Herbert W. Vaughan Senior Fellow at the Witherspoon Institute and the Ronald Reagan Honorary Distinguished Professor of Public Policy at the New Bar Inter honorary distinguished professor of law at Pepperdine University. And he has frequently been a visiting professor at Harvard Law School. He received a BA at Swarthmore College, a JD at Harvard Law School, a MTS at Harvard Divinity School, and a PhD at New College, Oxford. As a doctoral student at Oxford, he studied the philosophy of law under the supervision of John Phineas and served as a lecturer in jurisprudence in New College and has been awarded several honorary degrees from Ho Oxford since graduating. Dr. George, it's an impressive resume and I'm thrilled that we're gonna have a conversation today. Well, again, thanks for having me on. I appreciate the work that uh, you and the New Jersey uh, Constitutional Republicans do. And uh, I thought it was, uh, it was very um, satisfying, uh, Doctor, for me to hear you uh, say a couple of weeks ago when we were, uh, had a phone conversation, and I was talking about Calvin Coolidge, and he said, you truly are constitutional Republicans, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Coolidge uh, was one of the last presidents to really know his way around the Constitution of the United States. Uh, and he actually respected it. And that meant uh, respecting the limitations of his own power. And that's a difficult thing to do, respect the limitations of your own power. As our founding uh, fathers uh, observed, the natural human tendency is to claim more and more and more uh, power. This is what made George Washington so great. You'll remember that when yes. word came to King George III that Washington was planning on relinquishing power, George III said, if he does that, will be the greatest man in the world. And of course, Washington did it more than once. Uh, and Coolidge was very much in that tradition. Uh, when he ran up against a constitutional limitation of his power, as much as he might have liked to exercise a little extra power, causes he believed in and so forth, he held back because he understood that uh, the rule of law, the rule of the Constitution is paramount over any man, over any office, any president, including him. Uh, recent presidents uh, in both parties have not been so strict about observing the constitutional limits of their own authority. And so true, and this is why we have stressed the constitutional Republicans that we need the executive branch to work within the enumerated responsibilities that we read in Article 2. Of course, that, as you said, has not been adhered to. Well, you know, I say to my students, Mr. Carmen, that um, the most Please call, please call me JR. JR. <laughs> Doctor. The most neglected, the most overlooked word in the entire Constitution is the very first word of the very first sentence of the very first article of the Constitution. And that is the word all, A L L, all. I don't understand why people <laughs> cannot understand what all means, that all means all. Uh, the sentence reads as follows. All legislative power herein granted shall be vested in a Congress of the United States consisting of a Senate and a House of Representatives. It doesn't say some, it doesn't say most, it says all. And yet, 
Can anyone honestly say today that legislative power is exercised exclusively by the Congress at the federal level? Obviously not. There has been an enormous amount of usurpation of legislative power by the courts on the one side, that's what gives you constitutional catastrophes like Roe versus Wade. And then by executives on the other side, presidents essentially legislating, and often it's not the president himself who's legislating, it's some unelected, unnamed bureaucrat somewhere in the bowels of a federal agency making up the rules under which we live. There could not be a more flagrant violation of the principle that all legislative power herein granted is vested in the Congress. Now, Congress can't be let off the hook on this JR. It's not just that the judiciary and the executive stole it. The Congress abdicated it. In many cases, members of Congress, both houses, Senate and House of Representatives, are just as happy to let the executive and the judiciary make the laws so that they are not responsible for the laws that are made. They don't have to be accountable to the people for the laws that are made. And very often, they allow the executive and the courts, the president and the ju judges, to exercise legislative power when it's their own party in control of the executive branch and the courts. Isn't it something we see it every time we have a change of uh, government, a uh, change of political parties at the, at the head of the federal government? Here's what happens. People who had kept their mouths shut about usurpations by the president, trespassing, trespasses by the president on legislative authority, not set a peep when their party was in power, suddenly discover the Constitution. Mm -hmm. And when the other party's in power, they start complaining, squealing like stuck pigs about the president yes. overstepping his authority. And of course, what happens is you get a ratchet effect, JR, you get a ratchet effect so that a Republican does it. Now he's got a, he says he sets a precedent and the Democrat who comes in next, he does it and he cites the Republican president. And then the next Republican comes into power and he cites the president of the, uh, I'm sorry, the president of the Democrat who was previously in power. And what happens? The continual growth of executive power in violation of the constitution. So we Republicans right. have got to get back to that Coolidge-like Washingtonian understanding yeah. of the limitations on the power of all three branches of government and on the power of the federal government vis-a-vis -vis, for example the states we've got to get back to that understanding if we are truly to be constitutional republicans we've got to get back to an actual respect for the constitution especially when it comes to the limitation of powers and Dr. George, we've identified the fact that really we can go back to the very genesis of this with the FDR's first inaugural, March 4th, 1933, I believe it was, where he told the Congress that I'll work with you, but you need to give me expanded powers to fight this war. And he called it a war on depression. That word war is always used to increase executive power. But we saw that FDR had over 3,000 executive orders, and these executive orders have had the force of law, but we look back to that specific time, and that sp sp specific time in which we were very vulnerable because of the Great Depression, where FDR unilaterally expanded his executive power. Well, you're right to put the um, emphasis on the concept of war and uh, the use by politicians of the concept of war. Uh, and you're, you're right to point a finger there at, uh, at Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Uh, the founding generation understood that executive power would expand during times of war. That's necessary. The president is commander in chief, going to have to do certain things that would not be appropriate uh, in, in, in peacetime. But the hope and the principle was that at the end of the wars, which we hope would be successful for our country, the uh, powers uh, that had increased in the hands of the executive uh, would retract back to normal times. But once you can describe everything as a war, every kind of uh, disturbance or a uh, problem uh, as a war, a war on poverty, a war on drugs, a war on this, a war on that, then we're in a war constant state of warfare. And then what does that license? That licenses the executive acting as if it's wartime 
and grabbing more than his constitutionally allocated share of the powers. And um, it's no good. It's not good for a country. Uh, it's certainly contrary to the spirit and letter of the Constitution of the United States. Uh, so here again, you know, we've got to get back to the principle of respecting the Constitution, especially when it comes to the limitation of, uh, of powers. Now, as you're well aware, uh, Dr. George, our organization, the Constitutional Republicans, want to uh, echo the words of Abraham Lincoln, as he said in 1854, while he was still a Whig, that um, he basically created the first principles of the Republican Party. And he said that we need, he said, quote, let us readopt the Declaration of Independence and with it, the practices and policy which harmonize with it. That was the speech of Peoria, October 16th, 1854. Doctor, we believe the Republican Party, constitutional Republicans are calling for the re-adoption of the principles of the Declaration in creating our policy and our platform. Lincoln never tired of going back to first principles, going back to the Declaration, the critical concept of God-given natural rights, uh, the idea that there's a natural law higher than the human law uh, on which the human law must be fashioned. Uh, consistency with with which is the is the standard of evaluation of uh, our law. We should we should make our law for the sake of justice, honoring the principle of self evident rights. We hold these truths to be self evident that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Now we're accustomed to those those words being quoted all the time, uh, but. Uh, in Lincoln's time, it was a relatively new thing for him to hearken back four score and seven years and to quote that language. That language had been to a very considerable extent forgotten. It was Lincoln, really, who brought back the importance of looking back, hearkening back, drawing on that, uh, that founding principle. Uh, at Gettysburg, remember how he begins at Gettysburg, he says four score and seven years ago. Now, mm -hmm. if we do the math and trace back from uh, July of 1863, uh, 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 or that's when the battle was, he gives the speech later in the fall, but if we trace back the four score and seven years, we don't end up at 1791 with the Bill of Rights or even 1787 with the, uh, you know, the Constitutional Convention. What we get to right. is the Declaration of Independence, July 4th, 1776. It takes us to 1776. For Lincoln, this is the founding. This is the founding. And those principles articulated are the founding principles. The whole point of the Constitution, JR, is to effectuate, provide the mechanisms, the institutions for the effectuation of the ideals, the principles of the of the Declaration of Independence. So here in at, at Princeton University, you, you kindly mentioned I direct the James Madison program in American Ideals and Institutions, which I founded 21 years ago in the year uh, 2000 after I was appointed to the uh, McCormick professorship. I deliberately called it the James Madison program in American Ideals and Institutions. The ideals are articulated in the Declaration. The institutions are created by the Constitution to effectuate the ideals of the Declaration. Wonderful. Now, uh, Doctor, the first major principle that we read about in the Declaration is the laws of nature and nature's God entitling them to independence from Great Britain. So if you would, Tell us what the founders meant by the laws of nature, nature's God, which incidentally we believe needs to be reinstituted in the uh, ideal or providing the foundation for making law today and for Republican Party principles and policies to be formed after. But what did, do the laws of nature, nature's God mean? And that word entitling uh, our separation, there, there was the laws of nature, nature's God that were entitling us from the separation from the crown. What do we look to when we don't have a body of law to guide us, when we don't have a constitution? What do we look to when we're trying to decide what the law should be? 
What do we look to when we're trying to found a polity, create a constitution, written or unwritten? Mm -hmm. uh, are we simply at sea with nothing to guide us, no principles? Can we just choose principles out of thin air and whatever we like is fine? Or are we bound by reason and or God to choose right principles, principles of right, principles of justice? The American founders believed, Lincoln believed, that there are basic principles of right and wrong, principles of justice that are not man-made, that are not mere human manufacturers, that are not mere human artifacts, that provide the basis for us to found a nation, that provide the basis for a constitution and the laws then that are made uh, pursuant to the lawmaking uh, uh, rules and requirements of the, of the mm -hmm. constitution. That is what a grand philosophical tradition going way back beyond the American founding into the Middle Ages and indeed all the way back into antiquity called natural law. The natural law was distinguished from the positive law. The positive law is the man-made law in any, in, any, in any regime, in any polity. There's a man-made law. The question is, is the man-made law in conformity or out of conformity with the natural law? The law established ultimately by God, who establishes all things, makes human nature the way he makes it. Uh, the law that is therefore accessible to reason that we know through the use of our intellects and, and, and even if we don't happen to have revelation from the Christian point of view, it's the, the law that St. Paul is talking about in the, in the second chapter of his letter to the Romans, where he says that there's a law written on the hearts even of the Gentiles who don't have the law of Moses. They don't have the Hebrew revelation, right? You know, they don't have that blessing. Uh, the, right. the Teutonic tribes or the, the, the Roman pagans, they don't have that blessing. Um, but they can still understand some basic principles of right or wrong, sufficient that they can be held accountable and that God himself will hold them accountable, even though he hasn't mm -hmm. given them at that point the, the, the revelation. That's the natural law. This is what mm -hmm. Aristotle strove to understand. Plato before him, his teacher, Cicero, the great Roman uh, on the Roman side and the other great Roman uh, jurists. Uh, this is what uh, St. Thomas Aquinas in the Middle Ages uh, is concerned about in the portion of his great work, the Summa Theologia, which has come to be known mm -hmm. as the treatise uh, on law. What are the basic principles of justice, of right, of good, on the basis of which we can create institutions? create constitutions, uh, create laws so that they will be in conformity with, with justice. And of course, the founding generation of Americans believed that when a government degenerated into tyranny, then as a matter of natural law, as a matter of natural right and natural rights, the victims of tyranny were entitled to overthrow the tyrannical regime and establish in its place a just regime. That's the claim of the Declaration of Independence. Now, I encourage my students and I encourage all of our listeners to read it. <laughs> Everybody knows what it is, but how many of us have read our own founding document? Read it. And it's then you should, you should think about it and think about it. I ask my students to do this. You tell me, you decide whether you think that the complaints of the colonists were sufficiently grave to justify the rebellion. Obviously, they thought they were, and they invoked the laws of nature and nature's God. Now, by laws of nature, what they mean is the laws accessible to human reason, which would be in conformity with the law of God who made man and made man reasonable. So uh, look at the, at the declaration. You'll see the list of the Bill of Particulars, the list of grievances against uh, King George and the, and the British, and you can decide whether you think that the rebellion was justified. As I say, clearly mm -hmm. they thought it was. They stated their reasons. They said that a due respect for the opinions of mankind requires that they state their reason, reasons. They stated them. And then against all odds, JR, <laughs> all odds, they defeated the greatest power on earth to win their independence. Right. No betting man would have bet on the American colonists. You were up yeah. against the greatest power. There was no way they could win. Uh, yeah. I don't blame Washington for believing that it was the hand of Providence 
going far beyond. He wasn't just being modest. It was going far yes. beyond anything he, as a mere human being, was capable of. He was a great leader, a great statesman. Lost some battles, as you know, didn't win them all, that's for sure. Uh, uh, but he himself perceived in this the hand of uh, the hand of providence. You might or might not agree with that, but it's pretty remarkable. Oh, no. I mean, the chances oh, of the colonists. Totally. <laughs> the, 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 I mean, the, the fate of the colonists really was to hang as uh, as uh, yeah. as uh, seditious, uh, as uh, yeah. treasonous. Uh, that That's what anybody would have expected when they pledged their lives, fortunes, and sacred honors. They meant uh, sacred honor. They meant their lives, for sure. They meant literally we pledge right. our lives because right. the, it's very likely that had the revolution failed, they they would have been hanged. A few of them might have been given a reprieve, but I, I would imagine that most of them uh, would have been uh, would have been hanged. Uh, but they they did prevail, and, and this magnificent experiment in Republican government and ordered liberty uh, went forward. I'm amazed, uh, doctor, at the orders that Washington would give as he was the general of the Continental Army, and he would continually tell, uh, communicate the idea of either conquer or die. He said that phrase over and over and over again. It was either conquer or die. And he thought that the uh, behavior of the troops had an effect on whether Providence would look favorably or whether God would look favorably upon the Continental Army. He called for morality. He didn't want any uh, profane language. He, he railed against. He railed against games of chance. Um, it's remarkable how seriously he took it. And I really think he was shaped by the fact that he was shot four times at the age of 22 or 23 years old, leading the Virginia Regiment in the French Indian French War, Indian and War. how he survived that. And he and he that stayed with him his entire life. Um, he, the he idea felt the of hand divine of, providence. He, he felt the hand of providence on his shoulder from his youth. Uh, mm -hmm. It was always there. And what you point to there, Jr., is really remarkable. I mean, you're dealing with soldiers, right? Imagine telling soldiers no profane language, no gambling, <laughs> you know? uh, right. no chasing after prostitutes, right? I mean, that's most armies, right. uh, you know, wouldn't uh, wouldn't respond very well to a leader uh, who made those kinds of demands. Uh, but of course, Washington commanded respect in his very bearing and presence. He commanded respect. People would listen to yeah. him who wouldn't listen to anybody else. People would respect and honor his wishes. Uh, he was an extraordinary individual, just at the right place at the right time. He had to deal with these squabbling associates. And, and this continued into his yeah. presidency, of course. <laughs> Jefferson and Hamilton you know, were constantly at each other's throats. They had very different visions of the future of the nation. They had personality conflict as, as well, and he had to deal with them. Uh, he handled that really quite beautiful. It was very vexing to him. Very vexing to have them mm -hmm. uh, squabbling. But while we're on the subject of, of, of Washington, it's worth recalling that once the miracle happened and the col colonials won their uh, independence, defeating the greatest power on the face of the earth, they had to face a really hard question. Now what do we do? <laughs> We've won. We're yeah. free. We're, we're our own country. Now what do we do? What kind of government do we create? How do we avoid simply replicating uh, homemade here on our home soil, the tyranny that we suffered under when the English were in charge. How do we protect liberty and prevent tyranny? First thing they had to do was decide what form of government to have. Now, as you can imagine, JR, there was a certain amount of sentiment for a monarchy. After all, you had a great monarch, you had a great candidate, best possible credit, George Washington. Right. <laughs> he didn't want it which made him an even greater yeah. candidate. I mean, he's the perfect king. The perfect <laughs> king is the guy who doesn't want to be king. <laughs> That's uh, right. So Always uh, providing can, the example. You can understand uh, why they might, uh, at least some might favor a monarch when you have uh, someone like Washington uh, available. Um, now, why didn't they just rush to the idea of a republic? Eventually, they did get to the idea of a republic. That's what they settled on, and they gave us a republic. But why didn't they just rush to it? Anybody ever ask that question? We should. Mm. The answer is simply mm -hmm. this. Republics have been tried throughout history. In the ancient world, in the medieval world, in the Renaissance city-states, they had always failed. And when they failed, JR, they didn't just fail. 
they were yeah. always replaced by tyrants, by the worst form of tyranny. So a lot of people in the 18th century, based on long human experience, decided that, well, look, the safest thing to do is to try for hope for um, some sort of a ben benign despot. <laughs> you know, that's better than yes. having the tyranny you get when you try a republic and a republic fails. Now, you have no guarantee that your despot's not going to be a, a, a tyrant. But uh, the history of the failure of, of republics was very much on their minds. But nevertheless, they decided to give it a shot, to try it one more time, knowing, and they were cognizant, JR, knowing that if they failed, that would be it, that republics would never be tried again. People would draw from the failure of the American Republic the lesson that Republican government is just not feasible, just not possible. People cannot govern themselves. They need to be governed by their betters, by the superiors. And of course, this is the whole point of Lincoln in the Gettysburg Address reminding the American people that what is being tested by the war is whether Republican government can be made to survive. What does he say? His prayer at the end of the Gettysburg Address is that this nation under God will have a new birth of freedom and that government of the people by the people and for the people will not perish from the earth, not from the North American continent, not what will just fail here, whether it will perish for the earth. Now, all government is government of the people. <laughs> all good government, all decent government, even if it's the government of a benign despot, is government for the people. A good king will govern for the people. What's unique about Republican government, what makes Republican government Republican government, what's special is it's government not only of the people, which all is, or for the people, which all good government is, it's by the people themselves. And Lincoln recalling the idea of the American founders that what we've got is an experiment here, a test, is saying to the American people, if this war destroys this republic, it destroys not just this republic on North American soil, it destroys the very hope of humanity that human beings can ever govern themselves. It will mean henceforth and forevermore when people look for constitutions to govern their societies, they will look to some or another form of authoritarianism, some form of the superiors ruling the inferiors. This is why it was so critical to Lincoln to fight the war. He, he knew, by the way, he wasn't fooled. A, a lot of people early on, a lot of people when the war began thought this thing will be over fast. Bo both sides thought they'd win fast. <laughs> Sherman didn't. He understood it would be a long war. Lee didn't. And Lincoln didn't. But Lincoln was willing to fight the, the war at an astonishing cost of, of, of blood, an astonishing cost. I mean, just think of the population of the United States in those days, and 750,000 men massacred, killed. Um, he was willing to fight it because he saw the whole future of humanity, not just the American people, the whole future of humanity at stake. Truly remarkable, uh, Dr. George. And I just wanted to uh, step back a moment. I want to share a screen with you and look at a um this is a um slide that is on our initial uh principles or initial presentation that i'm giving to each of the um republican organizations um throughout the state and um i just wanted you to observe this um for a moment, this slide, as we go back, just for a minute, just step back I'm on the laws of nature, nature's God, which provided the legal standard for freedom into the forms of government that would evidentially, event, uh, evidentially be structured in the Constitution, eventually be structured in the Constitution. So the idea of the laws of nature, nature's God being uh, used as a legal standard, is that uh, accurate to uh, think of it in that regard? Well, yeah, I mean, this is uh, this is the idea that Link, uh, that, uh, Lincoln, that Jefferson puts forward in the uh, in the Declaration of Independence. Now, uh, Jerome, when Lincoln was Lincoln, I keep confusing Lincoln and Jefferson, when Jefferson late in his life, I think it was about 1824, 
uh, is asked mm -hmm. by Henry Lee uh, where he got the ideas for the Declaration. Uh, he responded by saying there was nothing new in it. None of these ideas were new. They expressed right. the com what he called the common sense of the American people, the harmonizing sentiments of the American mm -hmm. people as shaped by the traditions that, that formed them. Now, if we ask what those traditions are, I mean, clearly the Bible is central. <laughs> clearly, yes. Americans are shaped by the scriptural understanding of justice. Uh, mm -hmm. the, 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 the prophet calls for justice for the widow and orphan. The, 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 the prophet condemns those who oppress, those who exploit, and so forth. Uh, so uh, the Bible is central. Uh, but, uh, but Jefferson mentions, in addition, some philosophers, and not just Enlightenment philosophers like Locke and Sidney, although they are mentioned and they are among the influences on the American founding, but he goes all the way back to antiquity, to Plato and mm -hmm. Aristotle and Cicero. Mm -hmm. So there's a rich understanding of the streams flowing, we might say, from both Athens and Jerusalem, or Athens and Rome and Jerusalem, uh, the streams flowing into uh, the American, the American founding. It's not just the Bible, although the Bible is very important, but it's not just philosophy. It's not just uh, the Enlightenment. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a, it's a set of influences coming from different places, but all converging on the basic idea of natural law and natural rights, of the laws of nature and nature's God. Right. And that phrase is so rich, uh, Dr. George, and it can include, uh, can it not, the laws of the universe, the, God, the laws that God has legislated to sustain order and continuity throughout the entire creation and all therein, as well as the revealed law, which is the entire Bible, uh, plainly seen in Exodus and the Ten Commandments and Leviticus, Deuteronomy and the New Testament. And then, as you said earlier, with human reason and conscience, as we read of in Romans 2.14, for when the Gentiles, and that word Gentiles really essentially means anyone who is not a son of Abraham, anyone who is not a Jew, who had the law, and they do the things that are contained in the law, they having not the law or the law of God as it was given to the Jews, they are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness. And that is the conscious that we are all created with. So that phrase is so rich. And would you think, would, would you agree that all three of those um, ideas are uh, encapsulated within the laws of nature, nature's God? Yeah, I, I think this is what Jefferson and the founders uh, have in mind. Um, uh, by Gentiles, uh, St. Paul means the people who don't have the revealed law, the law of Moses, as I mentioned earlier. Um, does that right. mean they can't have any mm -hmm. knowledge of true and false, good and bad, right and wrong? No. Paul says mm -hmm. they can have knowledge, knowledge sufficient to hold them accountable, knowledge sufficient for God to even judge them, even though he has not, at this point, deigned to give them the law that is um, uh, revealed in, in Scripture. Uh, when it comes to this question of the uh, relationship between the overall cosmic order uh, and the world of human affairs. The great theorist of this is St. Thomas Aquinas in the high Middle Ages. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. He refers to the natural law as man's mm -hmm. participation by reason in the eternal law, which is established by God. The eternal law means mm -hmm. God's mm -hmm. ordering of the whole of the cosmos, the whole of what is. God orders it. And what's very special, according to St. Thomas, and, and this becomes part of the Christian heritage, what's really important and different about human beings is that God directs them to their proper purposes, not uh, by instinct or by impulse uh, or by command in the sense that, uh, that you know, the, 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 the sun rises in the uh, east and sets in, in the west. God directs man, unlike anything else, on any in, in, inanimate objects or animals, brute animals, directs man to his proper end 
by giving him the use of reason and freedom. Um, Genesis, uh, the book of Genesis, first chapter, says that God fashions man in his very image and likeness. Man he makes in the image and likeness of himself, the image and likeness of God. Now, what does that mean? Obviously, it can't mean that God has five fingers on each of two hands and hair on his head and a nose, right? Because God's a spiritual being, uh, beyond being. Uh, what does it mean? Well, St. Thomas tells us, and this has to be right, uh, I don't, can't think of any other, any alternative understanding, that it means that like God, we share in the powers of reason and freedom. God has seen fit to give us a certain, limited to be sure, share of divine power. What is the special thing about God? Well, God can cause things God is not caused to cause. Now, we're not God. <laughs> we're limited. God causes us to exist. Nobody causes God to exist. And yet he gives us the power to cause things that we are not caused to cause. That is, like God, we can envisage a state of affairs that does not exist. We can perceive, understand, grasp the intelligible point, the worthiness, the value of bringing it into existence. And then we can act through free choice by reason, uh, not just on impulse or instinct to bring that state of affairs uh, into existence. It's in virtue of our reason and free will that we are in a very limited way, but nevertheless, really God-like, made in the image and likeness of, of, of God. So when we look at the whole eternal order, the whole eternal law, the, the all that God has made and ordered it, we see one thing that is the human being that has this very special God-like quality, the only thing God makes in his own image and likeness, and that is man. And that means man has a very special standing, a very special dignity. And that is the foundation, J.R., of the teaching of our religious traditions, especially Judaism and Christianity, and the teaching of our political tradition, beginning with the Declaration of Independence, that each and every member of the human family is the bearer of profound, inherent, and equal dignity. That's it. That's it. We're each bearers, just in virtue of our humanity, of basic rights, of basic dignity. It, it's not something we earn. It doesn't have to do with how strong we are, or how smart we are, or how pretty we are, or our athletic prowess, how wealthy we are, how much social standing we have, how much prestige. In respect of basic dignity, each and every member of the human family is the equal of the other because our dignity is inherent, it's not achieved. Right. It's not a privilege. It's not a gift of any human power. And because that yes. dignity and those basic rights are not given by any human power, they may not legitimately be taken away by any merely human power. We are answerable for the use of our freedoms to God. But since men didn't give them, not congresses, not presidents, not parliaments, not kings, men cannot take them away. That's a really profound teaching. The Romans didn't have that. Even the Greeks didn't have that. The other great civilizations didn't. They could, uh, for, uh, some ancient pagan civilizations could call someone like Alexander the Great, the Great. What made mm -hmm. Alexander the Great great? That he could conquer and dominate other people, bend them to his will, become their superior, treat them as inferiors. We Christians or Jews, and I think that members of other religious traditions, and and we Americans don't think you're great because you can bend people to your will and conquer and dominate them. We believe in the profound, inherent, and equal dignity of each and every member of the human family. We think rulers are servants of the people, not masters.
Oh, there you are. Dr. George. We've had some uh, technical difficulties, obviously, with the because uh, it's fascinating what, what we're discussing here and what you're presenting to us uh, regarding uh, the equality aspect. And I just wanted to add, Doctor, too, that we read twice in the scriptures that God is no discriminator of persons, uh, no respecter of persons. No respecter of persons. King James yeah. translation. Yeah. That's right. And the other and the other interesting aspect is that we're all created equal in that we are born in sin. And that uh, we uh, inherited that from our first parents, and that is also uh, a common denominator, that, common denominator that we all share. But uh, we only have a few minutes left, uh, Doctor, and I wanted to uh, ask you a question about um, the purpose of government is often uh, not discussed, or many people really don't understand because of the elimination of civics. Uh, education in our public schools and in some regards even in higher institutions of education like the universities and colleges but many people don't believe don't understand the purpose of government and the declaration of independence clearly says that the purpose of government is to secure these rights and what rights life liberty the pursuit of happiness and of course there are other rights that the founders understood like the right to be married um, the right to have a job uh, or the right to be able to seek employment. So there are other rights, but the job of the government is to merely secure those rights, not to provide for them, correct? Well, it's a complicated uh, story there. I think the declaration in that second sentence tells part of uh, the story, but not the whole of the story, because there are things that government does and legitimately does that are not really conveniently referred to as uh, as rights, although you can, at some strain to the language, put them in terms of rights. So governments of general jurisdiction, historically and to this day, including here in the United States, are understood as exercising what in the common law tradition we inherited from the English are called police powers. These are the plenary powers to protect public health, safety, and morals and to advance the common good. Now notice that I said governments of general jurisdiction. That's the British government, uh, the central government in Britain, that's the central government in France. That is not the central government in the United States because our founders, I think very wisely, and I wish we would get back to this, honor their uh, selection here. Uh, our founders decided that they did not want to vest general jurisdiction in the central government. We, we were a large country even at the beginning and we become a much larger country. They wanted general jurisdiction to be vested in governments closer to the people. So they vested general jurisdiction and hence police powers in the states, not in the national government. The national government mm -hmm. has no general police powers. The national government rather is a government of delegated and enumerated powers empowered mm -hmm. by the constitution to do certain things. They are set out there mostly in uh, in the uh, uh, eighth uh, section of, uh, of the first uh, article of the Constitution, raise armies and navies, uh, regulate commerce among the states and so forth and, and so on. But the federal government, what we call the federal government, the central government has no powers not delegated, at least implicitly, from the people through the Constitution to them. That means where there's not a delegated power, that power rests with the states, or if it has been prohibited by the Constitution to the states, like the power to confer titles of nobility, that means it doesn't exist in any American government. And there, mm -hmm. uh, the government uh, at any level, no, at no level is a government uh, empowered to, uh, to act. Uh, but I think it is true, and, and Jefferson, as governor of Virginia during his uh, tenure there, uh, understood it was true and acted on it. Uh, that uh, as, as governments of general jurisdiction, states do have a plenary authority. Uh, so they can, for example, um, create causes of action for defamation uh, or prosecute obscenity, uh, set the legal standards for uh, marriage, uh, uh, protect uh, uh, human life. Uh, there are all the things that states as governments of general jurisdiction can, uh, can do. Uh, there was a recent embarrassing uh, comment by um, uh, Justice uh, Sonia Sotomayor during one of the mm -hmm. oral arguments in which I, I hope she simply misspoke, but what she mm -hmm. said was 
that if a state has a power, then surely the national government has a power. Now, she can't believe that. I mean, she's she's a Princeton grad. Uh, I, I know, you know, she has studied <laughs> constitutional law. She's a distinguished jurist. There are uh -huh. lots of powers that the national government does not have because they have been vested by our constitution in the states as governments of general jurisdiction. The 10th amendment to the constitution reminds us of precisely that. And it would be the case uh -huh. even if there's no 10th, there were no 10th amendment because 10th amendment is really simply a reminder. You, you know, uh, JR, the um, founding fathers had another decision to make once they decided we're gonna be a republic. Then they had to decide, okay, exactly what kind of republic are we gonna be? Now, how are we gonna protect liberty and prevent tyranny? One possibility would have been to say, okay, we're gonna give general jurisdiction to the national government, give them police powers, and then we're gonna check their powers by entrenching a bill of rights that limits what they can do to protect the rights of the people, and then empower a judiciary, maybe an unelected, uh, electorally unaccountable uh, judiciary uh, that can't be retaliated mm -hmm. against politically to enforce those rights. And unfortunately, many I, Americans mistakenly believe that's the system we do have. But it's not. Yeah. They did not. That's uh -huh. why the Bill of Rights is a set of amendments. It's the suspenders to go along with the belt. Uh, the, the fundamental right. principle by which the American founders sought to protect liberty and prevent tyranny was by checking power, by limiting and checking yeah. power. The national government power is limited by the delegated powers theory. Right, that, that it only has the power specifically delegated to it. It can be implicit, but it's specifically delegated to it and no additional powers. No matter how good it would be for the national government to exercise a power, if it hasn't been delegated, they don't have it. But of course, so many presidents and Congresses have trampled against that, trampled on that principle, have trespassed against that uh, principle. And so now we have the federal government regulating in areas that really are the proper province of the states. Right, just like we saw with Roe v. Wade, uh, and yes, um, right. also, and also, uh, Doctor, um, I wanted to ask you about what we are doing as an organization, the Constitution Republicans. We are employing our citizens to hold any candidate and all ele elected representatives accountable to constitutional literacy and intellectual rigor. And without either, it is impossible to properly represent the constituents. Now, how important was it to the founders that an educated public needed to be perpetually maintained? And in our case, it needs a restoration. So important, so critical. Uh, James Madison famously said that only uh, well-educated people can be permanently a free people. We, we have those uh, words emblazoned on the wall of the uh, a building at Princeton called Corwin Hall, which was until very recently the home of the Department of Politics, where uh, my chair is. Only a permanent, only a well-educated people can be permanently a free people. And by well-educated people, he had primarily in mind there a well-educated people about the constitutional principles of their country. Uh, civic education is what was primary in Madison's mind when he said that. And it's pretty straightforward, JR, when you think about it. Um, it doesn't really matter quite as much. It still matters, but not quite as much uh, that people be well-educated in civic affairs when they're under a monarch or when they're mm -hmm. um, being ruled by an aristocracy. Mm -hmm. But boy, it really matters to the quality of government when the people themselves are doing the governing. If yes. they are not well-educated, especially about the principles of civic life, they're going to botch everything. They're going to mess everything up. This is why civic education is so critical and why I'm so concerned by the poor quality of civic education around the country uh, today, especially in K-12 uh, education. I I'm blessed to be able to teach some of the most brilliant students in America. I mean, to get into Princeton these days is unbelievably difficult. Yeah. These kids are super high achievers. They are the top of the class super high IQs and they're great kids. They really are. They, they really inspire me with hope for the hope for the future. A, a lot of people are giving up on our, our, our young people, but I see so many wonderful ones. And yet they come right. to Princeton with their 1580 SATs and valedictorian status and all these achievements, not knowing mm -hmm. the basic principles of American 
Republican democracy. They, they uh, for example, are caught by surprise when I teach them that the national government, the federal government is a government of delegated and enumerated powers as distinguished from the states, which are governments of general jurisdiction. That's new to them. They shouldn't have to wait to come to Princeton. And it shouldn't just be these elite kids who get to Princeton who learn that. You know, that should That's be right. in, every, in every high school. I'll give you another one. Just in the past five, five or six years, I've noticed this. So they come into my constitutional interpretation class or my civil liberties class, and I'll say, now look, in our jurisprudence, our First Amendment jurisprudence, which we, of course, treasure so much, our First Amendment, in our First Amendment jurisprudence, there are certain limited small number, certain though categories of speech that are not protected by the First Amendment. Most speech is protected, but there are certain categories that aren't. Can you name mm -hmm. some? All right? So... I'll give you I'll give you a hint. Uh, defamation is not protected. Speech. Mm -hmm. Intimidation is not protected speech. Incitement to criminal activity is not protected. False advertising mm -hmm. is not protected. Obscenity is not protected speech. What else is not mm -hmm. protected? Speech? And you know, kids will raise their hands and they will say, hate speech. That's not protected speech. And they couldn't be more <laughs> wrong. Of course, there is no category of unprotected speech anywhere in our jurisprudence. There's not a single justice in the Supreme Court of the Supreme Court ever in history and to this day who says that mm -hmm. we have a category of hate speech that's not protected. Mm -hmm. All political speech is, is protected. Even if it's racist speech, yeah. it's protected. Uh, the, right. the leading case on the subject, the Brandenburg case from 1969, involved a KKK a leader, Ku Klux Klan mm -hmm. leader in Ohio, whose yeah. rights to free speech, despite his being a terrible racist, were protected. And we protect it because political speech is the very core of the First Amendment and is so critical to the functioning of a democratic republic like the United States mm -hmm. uh, of America. So, you know, we've really got some work to do with our young people and they shouldn't have to wait to college. I should be doing as a college teacher some more advanced stuff with them. But you know, I want to say to my friends who teach history and social studies and civics at the high school level, my colleagues at the high school level, you know, tell my kid, tell the kids you sent to me, you're going to send to me, and other professors around the country, tell them about the difference between the national and the state governments. That tell them about the First Amendment. Make sure they have a basic understanding of the constitutional system, and then we'll take it from there. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And uh, Dr. We feel very honored. We believe that, you know, we are an extension of what you're doing and providing education for our older citizens who aren't in college anymore because they never received this type of education. And we're teaching them civics and we're talking to them about the Federalist Papers, initial principles of the Republican Party. And um, so we really support what you're doing, of course. But we really feel an, uh, an, uh, really a relationship that's there, a commonality, and that education really is the number one. That's our number one objective is to educate our citizens on the political theory of the founding, the, um, the system of government derived from that theory, and then also restoring the initial principles of the Republican Party, which we talked about earlier, going back to the Declaration of Independence. But the yeah. other thing that I want to, uh, the other the other aspect that we want to uh, um, congratulate you and look to you as a leader, as well as Dr. Cornell West, the uh, dialogue, the friendship, the 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 reason that you both, uh, you know, you're talking, you're discussing, you're, you're you're using logic, reason. There's respect for one another. You couldn't have two more diametrically opposed views, but yet you get along and you like each other. And we see in today's political environment, terrible polarization where nothing can get done. Everything is done according to the leaders of the party. And we need to bring back, I really think that you and Dr. West personify the example that our representatives should emulate. And that is a decent conversation and having the ability to be able to discuss these issues as friends. Well, uh, I know I speak for Cornell as well as myself in thanking you, JR, for what you said about the work and witness that we uh, do uh, together. It's very important to, to both of us. Uh, I truly love Cornell and I know that he truly uh, loves me. We disagree about some pretty important things, uh, but we also share some, some fundamental uh, beliefs. Uh, I mean, we're, we're, we're both Christians. We're both uh, very 
dedicated to protecting free speech. Uh, we both believe that we need to uh, de-escalate this insane uh, polarization and this hatred of citizens for each other. When you disagree with each other the, in, a, in a Republican democracy, it's important that we not be enemies. You know, we're just citizens, fellow yes. citizens who disagree, who see things differently. And today I might win, tomorrow Cornell might win, but there are no permanent victories in uh, Republican democracy, just as there are no permanent losses. You can always come back you know, and say to our, our fellow citizens, you know, we got that wrong last time. We, get a, we, have to, we have to rethink this. So Cornell and I are completely together uh, on that. And, and I love working with, we've taught together and gone around the country lecturing uh, together. And I learn from him every time we're together, not because we agree, we don't on so many right. important uh, political uh, qu questions. Uh, and yet uh, you can always learn from intelligent people with whom you disagree. And you should welcome the challenge that they give to make you think more deeply. Consider whether you might be wrong about this or need to revise in some way or another. Uh, your view of the thing. And even if you're right, often you'll find entertaining the challenge from a serious person will deepen your understanding of an issue about which you're right. Uh, I say it again to my, to my students. It's one thing, and it's important and good to know that something is the case so that you can check the right box on a multiple choice test like an SAT. That's good. And if that was all you could get, I, it would be worth it. But it's something more and better and deeper to understand not only that something is the case, but why it is the case and how it is the case mm -hmm. and what its relationship is as an item of knowledge to other things that are important that might be the case, or even what it's deeper, more significant, it's existential meaning, the meaning of its being the case is. And you can always deepen your understanding by engaging with an intelligent interlocutor, even if he's wrong, even if you're right. And of course, sometimes he's not gonna be wrong. You're gonna be the one who's wrong or partially wrong and in need of revising your view. All of us can only see partially. I, I'm a great believer in truth. I'm not a moral relativist. I think there is a truth and the whole point of inquiry yes. is to get at the truth of things. But all of us also yeah. know that he or she is fallible. And that means none of That's us right. are gonna have it perfectly. It's gonna be admixed or the truth that we have will be admixed with a certain amount of error. So we need to be open to being knowledge. Uh, final point, if I can shift back to that, that second word in your title and your, the name of your organization. The first is constitutional, and we've talked a lot about constitutional. The second is Republicans, and we haven't talked too much uh, about the Republicans. Maybe we can do that on another right. occasion. But I really sure. like your um, uh, conviction, your, uh, your dedication to the idea of getting back to the first principles of the Republican Party. And here it's critically important yes. for our fellow Republicans to understand this party was founded on moral principle. It was not just founded on economic efficiency. Economic efficiency is good and it's important. Right. It wasn't just a dedication to prosperity, though that's good and that's important. And we want our leaders to put into place economic policies that, uh, that uh, give us uh, prosperity, help the pie to, to grow, lift all the, uh, all the boats. And our party wasn't founded simply for the sake of national security, although that's critically important. It's important that we have a strong defense. Our party was founded to advance moral goals. At the yes. very first Republican convention, the party adopted a platform dedicating it to eradicating what it called the twin relics of barbarism, slavery and polygamy. Moral issues, and moral issues, you know, they scare people today. People say, oh, I don't wanna talk about moral issues. Right. Uh, we should talk about economics. We should talk about foreign policy. Uh, but we don't want to get into these moral issues, marriage, uh, sanctity of human life, and, and, and so euthanasia. We, we don't want to get into that. That's all personal stuff. That's religious stuff. No, that's not the Republican view. It never was. The Republican Party was founded above all on moral principles. And they're the same principles we're fighting for today. The profound, inherent, and equal dignity of each and every member of the human family. It was opposed to slavery in the same way today we are dedicated to fighting for the rights of the unborn, the newly born, the cognitively disabled and handicapped, anybody whose life is at risk in this culture that has deviated so far from its commitment to the sanctity of human life. And the Republican Party was dedicated to the protection of marriage. That second pillar of barbarism was polygamy. And we today yes. have to be equally dedicated to uh, defending and restoring the sound understanding of marriage and the family. These are not purely private matters. They are matters of enormous public significance and public concern. 
And we need to be able to talk about them and to defend our view about them, to articulate the truth about them mm -hmm. in the public square. Outstanding, Doctor. And of course, that is what another impetus that created this group was restoring the moral conviction of the party. Now, I remember back in the early 80s when 84 percent of the Republicans in this nation were against abortion. Today, it's almost 50 50. That is a shame. And we believe that the first unalienable God given right of life, we need to be defending and protecting. And that begins at the moment of conception. That's very, very important to us. And we identify with the, the, those moral issues that you've talked about, slavery and polygamy, they can be transposed to today. But before we go, doctor, I want you to uh, discuss a little bit about the program that we um, continually share and the uh, Madison's Notes programs, which are outstanding podcasts. But talk a little bit, just a moment, about the James Madison. Uh, JR, are you frozen uh, on me again? I, I'm not sure if you or uh, our viewers can can hear, but you had asked me to talk for a moment about the James Madison program, which I'm uh, happy uh, to do. As I mentioned earlier, we founded uh, the program. I founded the program in uh, the summer of 2000, July 4, 2000. We uh, use as our founding date, uh, and it's a program dedicated to helping our students and the more general public to understand America's founding principles and the institutions by which the Founding Fathers sought to effectuate those uh, founding principles. We run conferences, we sponsor courses, we hold symposia, we invite visiting scholars uh, who are doing important work or teaching uh, in um, civic life on questions of civic life to be part of the Madison uh, program. And we try to make a difference when it comes to civic education for our young people, especially these Princeton kids who are going to be leaders in uh, government, in uh, business, uh, in science, and so many other other important uh, areas. Uh, so that's the mission of the James uh, Madison program. Uh, we have a lot of public events. And for those who are here in New Jersey, if you're near Princeton, you should look on our website. Uh, you can Google the James Madison program at Princeton University, and you'll get a list of our events with times and uh, places. We've been mostly online, of course, for the, uh, this COVID period. But I hope we'll soon be back to in-person events. But either way, you're welcome to Zoom in or show up and, uh, and participate. Uh, in our uh, events. Uh, we're delighted to have such a terrific host as the University, uh, Princeton University to uh, uh, be the host for the James Madison program. It uh, uh, has been a great blessing for us for this entire 20 years and we try to be a force for good on the Princeton campus. Among other things, we ensure that there's genuine viewpoint diversity, something that's critical for the cause of education. Uh, the thing that makes the difference between education and indoctrination there can't be indoctrination when students are hearing a variety of voices. And we in the Madison program ensure that uh, lots of different voices, certainly the conservative voice among others, is heard uh, on the Princeton University uh, campus and that our students have the opportunity to uh, consider and decide for themselves uh, on the basis of the best arguments that uh, are available from competing uh, sides on any uh, issue of political significance uh, in our country. So JR, that's what we do uh, in the Madison program. I, I hope your, your viewers will uh, go to the website to learn more about and, us. And uh, just discuss for a moment, if you would, the American Freedom Alliance and how uh, important that organization is today. Yeah, we're just about to hit the first birthday of the Academic Freedom uh, Alliance. The Academic Freedom Alliance was founded at Princeton. It's now a national organization. It was founded in March of uh, 2021. And it's an organization that is meant to push back, and I mean push back hard against this terrible cancel culture that has descended on our country, and especially on academic institutions, not just universities, but also uh, K-12. We come to the defense of uh, uh, scholars who do uh, trespass against the dogmas that seem to be prevalent uh, on so many college uh, campuses uh, to make sure that people are in fact free to speak their minds and to challenge these uh, dominant orthodoxies. We know in academic life today there's a terrible problem with self-censorship. Uh, students for sure, students, uh, overwhelming majorities of students report that they censor themselves frequently, don't say what's on their minds for fear of retaliation, uh, personal or professional consequences, but it's not just students. Faculty members, too, are censoring themselves. They're not questioning these dogmas on campus, especially the woke orthodoxies, these extreme left uh, orthodoxies that have become 
uh, dogmas on uh, college campuses. So we want to make sure that those who do step up and speak out, uh, challenge these dogmas, challenge these orthodoxies, have support. Uh, they have uh, moral support from fellow scholars at institutions around the country and also have resources if necessary to defend their legal rights. And so we have a legal defense fund that uh, makes resources available to scholars whose academic freedom rights are being trampled by their universities to make sure that they can fight back. Well, with that, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I uh, will close. Uh, I know JR has uh, gone um, uh, dark on us because of a technical uh, problem. Uh, so I think it's up to me to close this event and I will speak for JR in thanking you uh, for joining us uh, today. It's been my honor and pleasure to speak with uh, JR and to uh, speak to all of you. I hope to see you at a James Madison uh, program function. Uh, ideally in person, but if not in person, uh, by Zoom. So thank you and God bless all of you. Goodbye. <laughs>